Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Kalise Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, we'll hear all about the holiday spirits that give bumps in the night from folklorist Jeff Belanger as we explore his latest book, The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters. And we'll head to the scary streets of Washington, D.C. That's not in the 413. But it is where frequent guest of the show, Western New England professor of law Jen Taub was after being invited to the White House holiday party. We'll hear from her what it was like to sip bubbly extra close to the West Wing. And earlier today, we got an announcement that we only get every other year. As we get closer to the darkest day of the year, we look forward to the return of the light and warmer weather and summertime. And just after the summer solstice is the return of the every other summer musical takeover of Mass Mocha in North Adams, Wilco's Solid Sound Festival. The festival is curated by the Chicago-based rock and also roll band Wilco. And joining us is the founder of this now iconic band, Jeff Tweedy, coming to us from Wilco's Loft Studios in Chicago. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I love this festival, and I've been lucky enough to go to all of them since back in 2010. Tell us, before we get into the lineup, which you're here to announce today, a little bit of the history of why Wilco, your band, wanted to take over the largest, at least in uh, square footage, contemporary (laughs) art museum in the entire country. Oh, I mean, who wouldn't want to take over (laughs) uh, the largest contemporary art uh, facility? That was a really amazing opportunity to... um, use a space like that for a music festival. Occasionally when we've been on tour in the in Europe, we'd played festivals that would happen in like the fall and they would be in schools or universities that were on break. Those were always really interesting and a little bit more manageable because they were usually smaller <laughs> festivals and they weren't hot and yeah. you weren't miserable and it wasn't <laughs> dusty. And yeah, the idea of going to a desert to go watch a music festival is yeah. like, t- yeah. I'm too old for that, man. <laughs> I was too old for that when I was 18. I think, you know, like, um, I don't know. We were never a festival band. We had to kind of grow into playing on bigger stages and seeing ourselves as fitting in in those kind of environments. So when we were given the opportunity to plan our own festival, it was more with those kinds of smaller, contained in a building type of uh, festivals that we had experienced. And then obviously you have, you know, your imagination runs wild when you have all of that space and all of that art to, to inspire you. Now there's two festivals. There's this one and, and Blue Sky. How do you curate them differently? Are there different feels that you, you try to bring to each space and each lineup? And the other one oh. takes place in the Mayan Peninsula. So the yeah, weather is very yeah, different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, Sky Blue Sky, the festival that we've done in Cancun. Yeah, it's a very different kind of lineup. We still play bummed out music on the beach. Uh, (laughs) I think that there's a little more wide ranging version of Wilco represented at Solid Sound. It's not like a purely curated from the bottom up kind of environment that we were able to do at, at Mass Mocha. And what's great about this is that all the members of Wilco get involved and curate their own little elements, show off some of their other talents, other family members that are part of the Wilco family, um, have their shows and their exhibits. And it really is, it's begun to feel like a family of Wilco that descends <laughs> here in Western Massachusetts. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea. That was kind of the idea from the beginning. One of the other thoughts we would always have at festivals is Wilco would get booked to play say uh, a more like new music or avant-garde music festival and then a week later we would be playing like a roots rock festival and then uh, you know sometime after that we'd be playing like a more pop radio festival and and Wilco seems like a band that's kind of invited to a lot of different environments to play our music but all of the separate side projects within our band all the different members, bands outside of Wilco, would rarely be invited to play the same festival. And so that was something we thought about, to have a festival that represents the latitude that we're giving ourselves musically inside of Wilco and outside of Wilco. 
the Wilco Solid Sound Festival is June 28th through 30th. And today is the day that the lineup is being announced. And we're speaking with Jeff Tweedy, the founder of Wilco. The lineup is long and amazing. And Khalees is very excited to talk to you about some of the specific <laughs> artists yeah. on this lineup. But let's let you lead it off, Jeff Tweedy. Of course, Wilco will be performing mm -hmm. uh, both Friday night and Saturday night. And then Jeff Tweedy and Friends on the Sunday, which that really feels like the big family get together as things start to wind down. But who else? Are you excited about this festival this year? Well, Jason Isbell is going to be there, which is a pretty exciting get for any any festival. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. We've got dry cleaning. Uh, Nick Lowe uh, with the Low Straight Jackets, one of our favorites yeah. of all time. Iris Dement, oh. you know, which... I haven't seen it at a lot of festivals. Um, I know. So we're excited about that. Do you need more than that? Well, <laughs> there's, there's lots more. Khalees, this, who this are you excited the, about? So the part of me that had its formative music years in the DMV is ex super excited to see Horse Lords on this list. I, I was hoping like, you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that their music is the perfect blend of those two areas. Like Baltimore tends to lean more into electronica and DC tends to lean more into like the mathiness of it. Mm -hmm. And I think their sound is a perfect blend of those two things. And I haven't really seen them outside of like below the Mason Dixon line. So yeah. I'm super psyched that they're coming. I'm really, really, re it's one of my favorite bands working. <laughs> yeah, they do something I think is that is rarer and rarer, which is like they are actual, an actual band with an actual sound that doesn't seem to be interested at all in sounding like anybody else. And <laughs> that's the ideal uh, in terms of a band, in my opinion. And so, yeah, I can't wait to see them quite amazing they're definitely on my have to see list but mm. then so is soul glow who yeah as a black person who plays rock music mm -hmm. it's always awesome to see other black bands that aren't necessarily what people think black bands are supposed to be or do and their sound is like so punchy and so in your face and so unapologetic and i it's like that they're on this list too yeah, that's a great band and it's just a relentless, exciting music. I think people are going to really love that. It might be an audience that hasn't been exposed to them as much, which I always think is kind of a plus. And that's what's so amazing about Solid Sound Festival. It's like you can go from hardcore punk to like legendary folk, Iris Dement, and then like and the Ethiopian music and also somebody mm -hmm. playing harp, you know, yep. all <laughs> within the span of these three days. And that's, and all, with that's all, the, all in the lineup this year, yeah. It's all yeah. great. Not to mention John Hodgman's comedy cabaret. I talked to Hodgman earlier today mm -hmm. that he did, did not feel comfortable disclosing which comedians exactly would be there, but uh, we're going to have him on to talk about those comedians and that <laughs> solidifies a little bit more around Solid Sound. I can't wait to hear what that. I haven't. I'm not privy to that information either. I'm on a. I'm on a need to know basis with that. I gave him one directive, just like nobody that's on Rogan. No, oh, that's a good directive to have. I think so too. We're speaking with Wilco's Jeff Tweedy, and we're announcing the Solid Sound lineup for 2024, happening June 28th through 30th at Mass Mocha in North Adams. But one of the other cool things I think about this festival is them bringing in podcasts, and I am over the moon that song. Exploder is on this list. Oh, yeah. Um, for people who don't necessarily know what that is or, and what they do, can you give them just a quick rundown? Yeah, it's a podcast that basically takes apart one song as like maybe is an iconic song by somebody or just a song off their newest record and kind of peels the onion, you know, like just kind of lets you see what all has gone into making the track sound the way it does. And that's a rare opportunity to get to see how things are changed from one layer to the next. I love it. I love the fact that um, Song Exploder, though, ties nicely into your your books, Jeff Tweedy. World Within a Song, How to Write One Song, it really <laughs> is you know, honing in on this idea of song craft, and we'll get to see that podcast uh, recorded live there. I always wanted the bands that I loved when I was growing up, whether they went meant to or not, to exhibit a strategy for living that felt like it would be achievable and helpful to me like a good strategy uh -huh. for living look like getting in a van and going and playing shows and putting <laughs> records out 
and in a lot of ways, it's it's a pretty difficult life, <laughs> but but I do believe in it as a as a strategy for living. Certainly, the creative side of it, and the, and the community side of it, the congregation side of it. You get together with different communities as you travel, and you form another community out of all these different places you get to be. Yeah, I, I do believe in it at this point in my life as something to be advocated for and something that should feel accessible and everybody should have permission to participate in. And if you don't have to get in a van to make that happen and you can, say, take over a large museum mm-hmm. and bring the whole family to you, even better. Yeah, and like if everybody goes home and makes something instead of being angry or, or like tearing something else down, that's like the coolest thing that you can possibly do it's outside, cool. of, outside of giving birth or something. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Is there one band, I mentioned before how um, the different members of Wilco curate different aspects of the festival. Is there one of these acts that is so very Jeff Tweedy and like one that is, you know, so very John Stewart? Is that how it works? Mm, Not really. I think that there's a lot of interlapping tastes in our band in spite of the fact that our individual bands outside of Wilco might appear to be more curated and more directed at one type of music we all tend to appreciate and enjoy a lot of the same music uh, from other genres and I think everything on the list usually ends up being something everybody in the band is excited about. Have there always been performances inside the museum and how do you figure out which acts are best or or who wants to do those extra performances inside the galleries? It's kind of intuitive some things just make more sense inside Um, We feel lucky that we have an opportunity to have some bands perform inside where they're more comfortable in a dark space. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The comedy obviously is, is feels more congruous to be inside and seated. I've learned that over the years that comedians (laughs) are really kind of terrified of a standing audience. (laughs) It's easier to throw tomatoes. I think that maybe, yeah, like they don't want to have when people have to get up to chase them or something, they're like, but there are also unannounced performances, and a lot of times it's not just the people on the bill, but friends of ours that are in other bands will come just to hang out and we'll put them to work. That has happened many times over the years. And, and, yeah, and she, David she, Byrne showed up at the very end of the last festival, which was such a delight. Yeah, it, it was, was amazing. Incredible. Speaking with chief curator of the festival, let's say, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, yeah. the festival lineup just announced today. Historically, Wilco on the Friday night set has done something fun and or unusual. So last time you performed the entire new album, uh, Cruel Country. You've done karaoke nights. You had uh, putting up for a vote to the listeners about what album in their entirety you wanted to perform. Performed being there, a double album, and then yep. went and as an encore performed Yankee Hotel, Hotel Foxtrot, Foxtrot, which was, was there for that year. one of the most <laughs> amazing things. Anything special that we can, that you're willing to divulge about what Wilco might do on that Friday? Uh, not yet. I'm not ready to divulge <laughs> it yet. Yeah. Okay. We're, 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 we're going we're gonna to hold that one uh, a little closer closer to the vest for the time being. Good. Also, it's good to be surprised sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I love the surprises. <laughs> I'm mostly just still kind of going gaga over this whole list. I'm yeah. like Horse Girl and Rat Boys and Etron de Air. It really is phenomenal. And Sylvan Esso doing a DJ set. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of late night stuff that uh, we're excited about. I'm usually in bed by then, but it's like <laughs> there's stuff for everybody. <laughs> I'll say one of the most magical experiences I've ever had at any concert ever was a huge rainstorm and which would cancel so many other festivals everybody gets moved into the museum you're forced to look at this incredible contemporary art and see all the little pop-ups in all the galleries the sun comes out jonathan richmond goes back into joe's field and plays an unbelievable set and then while jeff tweedy and friends are playing a rainbow appears over the sky (laughs) while you're singing a song about noah and the floods and it has become an iconic um (laughs) motto of of the uh, festival, look at that stupid rainbow, <laughs> <laughs> which Jeff Tweedy uttered from the stage as the rainbow uh, blessed us all. It was yeah. just too on the nose. It was like it, it was like it, it, it upset me. 
We fired that lighting director and we had to like, find a new person. Jeff Tweedy of Wilco, the lineup has been announced today for the Solid Sound Festival, June 28th through 30th. Jason Isbell, dry cleaning, Nick Lowe and Low Straight Jackets, Iris Dement, John Hodgman's Comedy Cabaret, Wilco multiple times and in many incarnations, and a whole lot more. And we're excited. We're hoping to come and bring the fabulous 413 show to the festival uh, on that Friday. So we'd, awesome. uh, we'll love, we'd love to be a part of it. Thank you. We'll look forward to you being a part of it every time. Thank you, Monty. For its efforts and curation with Solid Sound, Wilco is being honored with the first ever Mass Art Common Goods Awards for their incredible work with Mass Mocha, for their commitment to the Berkshires and their adventurous curatorial vision. In the words of Mass Art, the Mass College of Art and Design, they set out to create the kind of festival they as music fans would like to attend and in the process cultivated a long-standing civic institution that brings thousands of people economic activity an unmistakable sense of community and international visibility to one of the most beautiful corners of the Commonwealth. Here, here. Soon we'll hear all about the winter frights the season half wrought with folklorist Jeff Bellinger. And next, we'll party vicariously at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with the one and only Professor Jen Taub. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Jennifer Tom is a law professor at Western New England University and the author of Big Dirty Money and Other People's Houses, and she's host of the Booked Up podcast. She is not the Jen Tom from Amherst who just ran for town council, but we had to Google that to make sure. <laughs> she is the Jen Tom who's been our go-to Donald Trump indictment correspondent, but she's not here to talk about the indictments today because she is also the Jen Tom who got invited to the White House holiday party. Let me read the invitation. The president and Dr. Biden request to the pleasure of your company at a holiday reception to be held at the White House. And this was back in November, Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, at 2.30 o'clock. Very fancy. Thank you for joining us, Jen Top. Hanukkah's already over. Christmas is coming. So is New Year's. Kwanzaa and all that. A perfect time to just kind of kick back and get a little bit gossipy. How does one get an invitation to the White House holiday party, Jen Top? Oh, so I think so. What's here's what's interesting. When I got that, I'm going to answer your question. But you know, the email came the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and I almost had a heart attack because you know, who doesn't want to get invited to the White House for a holiday party. But it turns out that I already had plans for the week later to go down to DC to hear some Supreme Court arguments. So half of my brain was trying to have, you know, be thrilled. The other half was trying to think how I was going to finesse this to my husband. I was going to be going away two weeks in a row. And then my older daughter who was in town, I knew that she was going to accompany me. But how was I going to finesse both that I was going to F and go because it was the White House, yeah, yeah. which of course he would be supportive, but also trying to pretend I, I don't center myself in our entire family's life all the time. Right. You know what I mean? So Been it's there. Like, Been there, Jen Tub. I don't know anything about that. The good thing is, you know, one expensive glute of champagne in the middle of a White House dining room and any memory or feeling of guilt or even any family you have back home goes away. Yeah, so that totally. Was I don't even, I don't even know he, you people. Who? No, but how I got invited, I think, so just to be clear, I was really thrilled, but then I came to understand that there are like 20 to 25 holiday parties at the White House. But oh. I think this might have been the first one. It was it two days after like Jill, I think I can call her that. Oh, yeah. Flotus, Dr. Jill Biden had, I think, revealed to the press what her decorations were going to look like as a, you know, these were not like Melania's dystopian hellscape where everything looks sharp and, and dangerous. That was one um, of the things I appreciate appreciated most about their White House, by the way. I was like, yeah, all right. Go Shocking full on dangerous. Krampus with the decorations here. I love it. But uh, so it's one of many. And I think the reason why I was invited to this first one, you know, you start to figure out who else was invited, even though it's probably hundreds of people. And it seemed like these were all people who either had, you know, big followings on YouTube or they had podcasts. And so I was invited, I think, because some people consider me an influencer. What? You know, yes. We do. Thank you. There's a particular person in the White House who handles um, rapid response of digital stuff. And so I think she got me on the list. I can't even describe how joyful and magical it felt, especially because I did bring my 23-year-old Emily with me, who's a graduate student in particle physics 
but also loves theatrical stuff. Wow. Um, I had to throw that in. What's more theatrical in science than particle physics? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> is it a wave? But, is it a particle? Nobody knows. And but when she's they there together, with her explodes. like, you know, pink hair and nose ring and having so much fun. And she could do the stuff like I couldn't do, which is who are those really cool people everyone's surrounding? And she's like, mom, that's like the, the women from Dance Moms. Like, I didn't know who they were. Yeah. Or... That would be my greatest fear. Like, uh-oh, there's somebody super famous that I'm supposed to know. And either I recognize their face and don't remember their name or don't know who they are at all. Listen, when Cory Booker <laughs> enters a room, you know who that senator is. Cory Booker, I have a, had the opportunity to meet. I got invited to the White House conference on food, hunger, nutrition, and health last year. It wasn't at the White House. It was like right down the street because it was a big conference. But right. they were all fancy schmance people there. You had to get cleared by security. And there was like a million emails and things that went out before that to make it happen. But when Cory Booker's there and you are taking a selfie, tell me if he did this with you. Did yeah. he commandeer your phone? Totally. And, and take the selfie himself. He's he a pro. He knew the assignment. You walk up to him, you <laughs> smile at him, you say something, and he just takes your phone, turns the phone around, you turn around and you pose, and he just does it. He knows it. He doesn't yeah. mess around. I love that about him. That's fun. And I, there's a great picture on your social media with Cory Booker from- I mean, if you're going to like get in a photo with an expert at selfies, you let the expert take the photo. Absolutely. And he does And the tall guy. You know, yeah. I'm yes. not, I don't know if you know about this, but I may act tall, but I'm just like 5'3"-ish. <laughs> We're speaking with Jen Taub, who is a, a Western New England University professor of law and author and book podcaster and invitee to the president and Dr. Biden's holiday reception. What were some of the things that you ate? Because sometimes fun parties don't always have good food. I mean, before the food, like the feeling you walk in, it did feel like the magic wonder and joy. Everything, I became a child because everything was oversized candy and <laughs> letters to Santa. But the food, of course, is like you need to talk about. I mean, I think I took more pictures of food than I tasted uh. because <laughs> I was just so anxious. But um, and because, you know, like if you are kind of a kosher vegetarian, you could admire the giant heaping bowls of shrimp crab claws and like lobster tail but you really probably don't eat them right. but i've got a great picture of that anyway it was gorgeous and everything was on silver platters and then next to that were these tiny like little latkes or maybe they're considered potato pancakes because it's a russian thing with smoked salmon and you could top it with caviar etc yum or like is caviar the, kosher i don't remember I, I probably not. Um, <laughs> shush, I don't need to know these things. And then there are these like lamb chops. And then, I mean, they even had Brussels sprouts. Oh, and then Emily found, which I didn't see on the first run, this kind of spiral mac and cheese, but it was like cauliflower pasta mac and cheese. And it was so good. Mm. Cool. Um, and it might have been fake cheese too, but it was like the White House made it. And then there was this display of desserts. And I only, believe it or not, there were like gorgeous desserts. And I have all these pictures, but I only ate one and I ate a lot of one, which was were the uh, gingerbread cookies because they were so good and I need to make them at home. Mm. Um, yeah. And the champagne, I'm not a big drinker, but one glass of champagne got me snookered. Or maybe it was a glass and a half. I just kept filling it when you weren't looking. <laughs> so it's like the president and first lady mingling at the party or are they like in a corner under total lock and key by the Secret Service? Remember how I mentioned there are like lots of parties? So this was one. Joe Biden happened to be, President Joe Biden, uh -huh. happened to be in Colorado. But the first lady was there, except, so this thing happened. They had this, in one of the ballrooms, they had like this little cordoned off area with a setup, like a lectern set up and a mic. And that was where Jill Biden later came out with one of the cats to greet the crowd. And then she mingled. But when that was happening, you know, everyone was jamming into that room. And I tend to want to go to a place where I can breathe better yeah. and it's not as crowded. And so I had been in a different ballroom and that was where the most amazing thing that has ever happened in Emily my 23 year old's life happened so I although we missed Jill Biden we we saw someone who is more of a celebrity to anyone under the age of 25 and who is that it was the one the only John Green <laughs> For those who don't know who John Green is, tell us why, and especially why your particle physicist uh, daughter might be interested in, uh, in what he has to do and say. I think you know my connection to John Green. I don't think I do, actually. Oh, do you not? No. Uh, so John Green was a year ahead of me at Kenyon. Uh, Ohio. And had classes with um, somebody who was in my class, and in several of my classes, Ransom Briggs, who wrote uh, Miss Peregrine's. So my kid loves math, loves science, loves you know their phone and watching movies, wasn't the hugest fiction reader and the only author that she really read in high school you know of her own volition was john green's novels including 
The Fault in Our Stars, which was made into a movie and will make you weep, including mm-hmm. Paper Towns and so on. And I would read these books with my kids so I could kind of know, you know, have something to talk about. And also I love to read. And John Green also has, he's better known for something that high school teachers love and so do kids, which is this whole emporium on the internet called Crash Course, yeah. which he operates with his brother, Hank Green, who does the science side of things. We're standing in this room by one of the like nearly 100 Christmas trees. We're standing by one of them. And Emily says to me, oh, my God, that's John Green. And she was like, my, my daughter's shaking and she wants to go over there and talk to him. And so, you know, me, I'm like, oh, I'll introduce you. And she's like, get out of my way. I can do this one. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, great. Like, this is great. So she goes over. She sneaks her body in there. She shakes his hand. I get several photos of them together. And my favorite one is when she's looking it up, up at him like he's a deity and she's about to faint. <laughs> um, so they have a little conversation. And after they have it, I kind of say, oh, hi, you know, you know, thanks so much for what you do. And I asked how his brother was. I said, how's Hank? Because as anyone who follows him knows, Hank has just been through a bout of cancer. And John was really funny because he was like, hey, you know, he's doing great. And now he has no more excuses. He's got to get back to the office. You mm-hmm. know? And then I said, oh, you know, to work for our business. And we talked a little about his corporate structure because I got kind of nerded, nerdy out about like how, is it an LLC? Is it a corporate? <laughs> anyway, whatever. I'm a jerk. <laughs> so anyway, after that, after the whole thing, and what's really great about the White House is it's like this magical place. When you come in, they welcome you. They have this sort of staff, their staff, and then probably from the military, all in uniforms, and everyone's pouring champagne for you. And they're saying, have you seen this Christmas tree? And there's music. But when things start to wind down, they don't say, don't let the, you know, the door hit you in the ass or anything. They're really nicer people. They don't like <laughs> yawn. You know, it's not like my family were like, yeah, I'm tired now. Get out of here. No. But they actually they start doing things like shutting doors to rooms and then people uh, start to funnel out. They sort of funnel you in a direction. Gentle herding. Yeah, yeah. They heard you. And then they finally are like, hey, they start doing things like, thanks so much for coming. You know, and things like that. And so as That's we're being herded out, we're out into the darkness. And then, you know, Emily and I are still taking photos. And I see a squirrel on the White House lawn. And I hold my camera up between the, like, slats of the fence so we can get the squirrel. And this guy's like, hey, you know, can you guys be going? You know, then we're off. And we're off into the edges of the White House area where there's nobody around. And we're like, where should we go to dinner? We're like, okay, Google, you know, because that's all I know how to do. And I'm like, okay, there's this place called Old Ebbets Grill. But I think they usually need reservations. And I call them. They're like, it's five, lady. You can come in. You know, it's an early dinner. But as I mentioned to you, I didn't eat things. I just took their picture. Right. You know? So now we're actually hungry. And so they come see us and I'm being nice. I usually love to have my back to the everything in the restaurant. Like I'm a gangster. Like I don't want to I want to see everything. But, you know, it's my kid. And it's her special day. And I'm like, OK, do you want the booth? And of course, she hops into the booth. So I have my back to everything and I'm in the chair. And as I sit down, Emily says, ah, look behind you, look behind you. So I try to subtly look behind me. And in the actual four-person booth behind me is John Green and his wife. Wow. (laughs) So now Emily is like, okay, I've got to take a picture of you, mom, you know, so she can get him in it. And we can't, now she's like, my friends will never believe this. Like, what are the odds? Except if you know me, you guys, these are always the odds. My life is crazy. (laughs) At the end of the meal, all of a sudden Emily looks up and I feel some energy lurking behind me. And it's John Green. He's come to the table to say hello. Like he spotted her and recognized her from that moment at the White House. So now she's like, can't, her eyes are like as wide as saucers. And he's saying, you know, nice to see you again. And she said something. And then I just kind of turn my head over my shoulder and I say, hi, I'm glad you didn't think we were stalking you. And he said, well, if you were stalking me, you would have come over to my table. And I kind of arched my eyebrow at him and he said, oh, I guess I'm stalking you. And then I lift up my hands like this, you know, and I'm like, back off, Green. And and he cracks up and leaves. And the people next to me are like, what the f*** is going on here? And it was like, you know, they say you don't have to be a good parent. You just have to be good enough. But come on. I think I'm done. Anybody else say that you were really excited that you got to meet Jen, not just John Green for your daughter? Yeah. I mean, meeting Cory Booker yeah. was amazing. Did you get to go into any rooms you hadn't seen before? Did you get to, like, explore? The Resolute yeah. Desk? Did you hide underneath there like uh, <laughs> John John? Uh, yeah, they didn't let us into. We were in, you know, we entered in the east side, not the west side, and we didn't make it over to, you know, we weren't, like, invited over to the Oval Office. What was so confusing, Khalees, is that having been there before when it was, like, a work day, mm. like, I didn't even think I was in the same place. Like, I got very confused confused i had to go on the internet after i was there like when i'm at the airport going what room was that what room was that (laughs) first of all i have no sense of direction like if i go in an elevator and go up into an office building you spin me around once or let's face
place that don't even spin me around. I have no idea which is north, south, east, west or anything, you know? <laughs> so I was trying to figure out and I was like, oh, that was the Red Room. Oh, I know. You know, and my, my one touchstone is I know where the Michelle Obama portrait is. Mm-hmm. And so like, I'm like, okay, I know where I am based on that. But mostly it was just so festive and so incredible to be, you know, and also being the Jewish kid, you know, I love being around Christmas stuff. <laughs> I love Christmas music. I love Christmas trees. Jewish people wrote all the best Christmas music anyway. Exactly. So it's, it's, yeah. I know. So I'm kind of like, I'm one of those like, <laughs> oh, look what we made. Oh, not us. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think what was really great though is seeing my friend, um, Allison Gill, who's host of Muller, she wrote, mm. and seeing, you know, some of the people, you know, some of the activists who I know. For me, the the ability to hug people, connect with people, laugh, drink champagne, and just be escaped from the pains of the world. Because let's face it, there's two major wars at least going on yeah. in the country, in the world. Um, we're kind of at war in our society, a kind of a cold or hot civil war. We're in the middle of possibly reelecting an authoritarian madman. And just a bit of escape really helped me not spiral down into like a complete depressive paralysis now i'm sort of full of magic wonder and joy <laughs> that's what <laughs> it's all you through about. the rest of the season <laughs> well i wouldn't go that far please maybe <laughs> maybe until like friday or something jen Tobb is our go-to trump indictment correspondent but we're putting that aside <laughs> as the holidays are here to bring in some cheer to bring in some cheer the and also of... bubbly was the champagne good it was i'm not even a champagne drinker okay. but you know i just felt like at the white house it was better to take the you know champagne i was poured and then when i needed did something else go for the diet coke so i didn't start stumbling around like you said under the resolute desk and yeah. get arrested that's one way to make an impression <laughs> did anyone get that drunk at the party no, no darn it was... <laughs> police they screen you carefully <laughs> that's why we haven't been invited I, that's not the only reason we haven't been invited. <laughs> well you guys should be my plus twos next time uh, if I we're, can. we're there well i'm sure we're gonna have to have you on soon especially with all the supreme court stuff going on with the uh, potential i was going to talk about that now but who wants to be down no. you know, such no. a downer remember and also when we do was... that i can tell you about visiting the Supreme Court. Amazing. With a press Ooh. pass, you guys. Oh, that's Ooh. fun. Yeah. You're like Nina Totenberg. <gasps> she was there. What? She got in trouble. <laughs> she they had to hu- trouble. Was, yes. The security came over twice to hush her. <laughs> I swear to God. And her hair was perfectly coiffed. Man, it oh, was, man. It's wild. Like, if in another life, I would just move down to Washington and just show up at things and comment on them. <laughs> Dreaming. Although we allege that the White House isn't haunted, there's no guarantee that your dreams this holiday season won't be. Folklorist Jeff Belanger regales us with some of the more threatening myths and figures of the season in his latest book, The Fright Before Christmas. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. What a spooky, awesome background you got there. I know, I was going to say. Jeff (laughs) Belanger. Behold, spooky is my life. It's kind of my thing, Monty. Jeff Belanger is a prolific researcher of folklore and legends. He's the co-creator of the Emmy-nominated, award-winning New England Legends television series alongside our director, Tony Dunn, and is the author of over a dozen books, including the bestsellers, The World's Most Haunted Places, Weird Massachusetts, and Who's Haunting the White House? It's Jen Tobb! No. She said no one's haunting the White House. (laughs) They herded everybody out safely. Oh, yeah, okay. He's also the host of New England Legends Weekly Podcast, which has garnered over four and a half million downloads since it launched. He's also been a writer for the Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures for the last 15 years. His latest book, which is why he's here with us today, is The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters, which came out this fall. Here to talk to us about the more frightening aspects of the holidays is Jeff Belanger. Thank you so much, Jeff. And your background is, as we mentioned, kind of eerily holiday and spooky at the same time. (laughs) Which is perfect because that's what this holiday is all about. Exactly. It really is the dichotomy between like over cheerful, over saccharinated happiness and dark, deadly disaster. Yeah. Which is the razor's edge I try to walk each and every day. (laughs) (laughs) And if you get the book, which you should, I'm not allowed to tell you that. No direct calls to action on public. No, but I will say that the book was like a very fast, very fun, really informative read. And lots of pictures of depictions of the various creatures of the holidays. Including the one on the cover, which looks like a horrible demon with a Gene Simmons type tongue stealing a child. Is that? That would be Krampus. Is it Krampus? Because he's got the switch. Like, um,. Bell Schnickel. Yes, thank you. Bell Schnickel. Yeah. Like Dwight <laughs> Schrute Schnickel. from The Office, right? Yes. That's exactly right. Oh, judgment is nigh. 
But that Belschnickel is I. Yes, he is finally nigh. Yeah, no, that's Krampus. Krampus doesn't always kill you. Uh, sometimes he 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 just hits you if you're <laughs> if you're naughty. Fair enough. Um, that's the thing. You know, this season has always had this this dichotomy of good and bad. And and Krampus is not bad, by the way. I mean, does the person that doles out punishment is that evil? Mm. We need that, right? Now, I mean, that's a necessary part of society. And so a... that was Krampus's role. You know, there was good cop and bad cop. Good cop was St. Nicholas and bad cop was Krampus. I think people are getting to know Krampus a little bit more, but that's almost, I mean, not recent because it's a, you know, a very old tradition, but in pop culture, Krampus is gaining more prominence. But if Krampus is not something that you have ever heard of before, tell us about Krampus. He's a Yuletide monster that hails from Austria and Germany. Uh, he's covered in fur. He's got horns like the devil, a long red forked tongue. He's wrapped in chains so you can hear him coming. And he carries a sack or a scratchy basket. And he'll come around on December 5th, Krampus knocked, and he'll snatch up all the naughty children of the world, stuff them into his sack, bring them back to their mountain lair, and kill them. So come <laughs> December 6th, St. Nicholas is free to bring presents to all the good girls and boys because that's all that's left alive. And he doesn't have to do any of the weeding out himself. He is the naughty list. <laughs> Hands are clean. And so that's the traditional Krampus, right? And And... He, he was wildly popular. People gave Krampus cards instead of Christmas cards. This was all the way up into really the 19 teens, 1920s, before he was pushed far back into the shadows. But I'm here to warn you that he's coming back. As you mentioned, uh, popular culture. He got a movie deal in yes. 2015. Uh, Once yep. you get a movie deal, you're blowing up. I mean, when you think about the, the even the classic holiday songs, the like there'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago, or even the concept of Santa seeing you when you're sleeping and knowing when you're awake has always been scary to me. Yes, it's, it's a little big brother. Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight. <laughs> it's because they're mutants. They're mutants now. <laughs> Man, Monty, don't make it weird. Oh, I made it weird. You should see some of my family's Christmas cards over the years that have all pulled from these very lyrics to songs to show the frightening aspects yeah. of Christmas. Well, and who, of course. Who better to talk about it than Jeff Belander, whose new book is The Fright Before Christmas. So we talked about Krampus. Tell us about some of the other other strange and unusual figures that are part of this holiday tradition. Let's just set the stage. All of this fuss is centered around the winter solstice, right. which right. is the shortest day and the longest night. It is literally the darkest day of the year. Winter's coming. It's a time to be afraid when you live in northern climates because you've got to survive the winter. You have mm -hmm. to have enough food, fuel, and so on. And there's things out there that could kill you. The elements and, of course, these monsters. And so everybody knows Krampus because of the movie deals. But I, I got to say, I think the most dastardly is the Grilla from Iceland. <laughs> for sure. She, Krampus is just looking for naughty kids. If you're a good kid, you're safe. But Grilla doesn't discriminate. Good kids, bad kids makes no difference. <laughs> they all make good stew. You, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, me, she might even think the, the nice ones taste better. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe. Uh, so if, if you're lost in the woods around the winter solstice in Iceland, she could snatch you up, bring you back to her mountain lair, cut you up into pieces, cook you in a stew, and eat you. Mm. Children cassoulet. We mentioned Bell Snickel, which um, if you're a fan of The Office, you might be familiar with because of Dwight Schrute. But who's Bell Snickel? Bell Snickel translates to Nicholas and Furs. And each village would have one and and he works alone so he's not going to show up with saint nicholas he'll show up in like a patchwork of furs and have a face uh, covered in soot and he's dirty and he'll carry a switch of sticks each village would have one this year could be my turn and i might come to your home monty and i'd, I'd knock on the door a couple weeks before christmas and say hey any naughty kids here and you might say well this one's been an angel all year but that one little timmy there not so much and i'd take little timmy in the backyard and i'd tie him to a tree and i would beat him for you <laughs> i would beat him and beat him <laughs> with the sticks and this was and legal he could, you know, the good old day you invited me in it's like a you vampire. knew what was coming you told me where to go every year my grandfather would dress up as belschnickel at christmas he was okay at it i am great you know they say some people were born to be bad well i was born to be belschnickel and the beautiful thing is next year might be your turn to be the belschnickel you can come to my house and beat my children what happened to christmas you know, I there, know, is, there way, is a war on I, Christmas I, I feel that like we can't do this anymore. <laughs> the Belsnickel might not be, have been as much of the reason why Christmas was illegal here for a while. But that's true, it too, was. in New England. And this is, you know, your forte, Jeff Belanger, is talking about New England connections to these sort of things. If you watch Fox News, they'll make you believe that Christmas is a, a sacred Christian tradition that has been observed since Jesus was actually born. Not the case even for Christians, especially in New England. So Christians uh, have had a war against 
against Christmas for um, many, 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 many centuries. It was not something that was embraced. Uh, in fact, far from it. It was the Emperor Constantine in 336 that decreed December 25th would be the date of Jesus's birth. We don't know the actual date. The Bible gives us very little clues. But ever since 336, what he was trying to do was incorporate pagans and, and say, like, look, Jesus is he's a king. He's a king of kings. Kings need birthdays. And December 25th in the Julian calendar was the winter solstice, the Sol Invictus. It's the shortest day, but tomorrow marks the day where the sun starts to return. So he thought that would be the perfect date. And all the practices around it have always been associated with Saturnalia, with Yule festivals, all very pagan. So Christianity was really at war with the state until up in, you know, you said in Boston, but it wasn't just Boston. It was the British Parliament that banned Christmas. In England, which we were England then, Boston was England in the 1600s. So they banned it and, and they, they called it a, quote, satanical practice. And you'd be uh, fined five shillings for dressing festive, yep. giving gifts, making merry. Um, <laughs> five shillings. That was like three days wages for the working class. And, and even when the ban was lifted, it still was not a thing. It was not a holiday. Uh, they preach from the pulpit. We do more to dishonor Christianity in the 12 days of Christmas than all 12 months combined. And so it was really a, a big war against Christmas right up until very, very modern times when suddenly they just sort of incorporated it and said it's ours. But the reality was this holiday was built on the winter solstice. And no matter what you believe or don't believe, atheist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, if you're affected by the weather, this holiday was for you because we all have to look out for each other. No matter what we believe, it was the most inclusive holiday that ever was. And only very recently have we tried to divide it and make it more religious. I say if you want it to be religious, it can be. Go for it. But it could also be purely secular, too. And it could be totally pagan. So, like, when yep. people get really upset about calling a Christmas tree a holiday tree, you are more correct to call it a holiday tree than a Christmas, Christmas tree. tree. The tree has nothing to do with Jesus or the birth of Christ or anything like Those that. Those trees nothing. don't grow in the yeah. Middle East. That's right. No, absolutely. You're, you're totally correct. And also, to, I know when, when people get all upset about the holiday greetings, I've recently said, you know what? I accept any and all holiday greetings. Yeah. You can wish me a happy Hanukkah. You can wish me a Merry Christmas. You can wish me a happy holiday, a cool Yule, a Saturnalia, like a midwinter. I will take all of them. Thank you. I welcome them whether I practice them or not. We're speaking with Jeff Belander, who is the author of a new book that talks about the darker side of the darkest day of the year, the fright before Christmas, surviving Krampus and other Yuletide monsters. In addition to the Grilla, like the thing about the Grilla is that the Grilla is like a mob boss. She has this coterie of kind of henchmen and pets <laughs> that also go around with her or work, work kind of under her umbrella. And I thought that was really interesting. Can we talk about the Yule Boys and the Yule Cat slash Yule Goat? <laughs> Yes, of course. The Yule Lads, as, as the uh, folks in Iceland call it, 13 of them. And uh, they show up all throughout the month and they each stay at your home for two weeks. Uh, <laughs> the first one arrives December 12th. He's called the Sheep Coat Clod. And he's going to arrive at your home and just poke at your sheep with a stick. <laughs> so watch out for that. <laughs> and then on the 13th, the Gully Gok is going to come steal your cow's milk. So watch out for that. There's a spoon licker that will literally lick <laughs> the spoons clean. That's me. In your, in your kitchen. <laughs> My favorite, there's one that's called the Doorway sniffer he just <laughs> sniffs around your doorway i can't stress enough i didn't make up any of these right this is pulled right out of icelandic folklore oh my word uh, door slammer one for two weeks he's just going to slam doors in your house all night long and you're not, not going to sleep all these creatures come down and you have to remember when iceland was first settled there were no humans there uh, it was covered by an ice sheet. The ice sheet retreated, and then it was covered with trolls and imps and fairies and ghosts and so on. But as people settled, all those magical creatures had to go up into the mountains. But come the solstice, they come back down to sort of collect their rent. That's when people are told, tell each other, you know, we stay inside, we stay safe. We tell each other stories about these monsters because we know whether you go outside and die from the elements or die from the grilla, what's the difference? This is our time to stay inside while those creatures come and lurk all around the very long dark night and kill us happy holidays everyone the yule goat or the yule cat is um this is kind of cool i actually think that sort of helps the economy a little bit in iceland you're supposed to wear brand new clothes on christmas day uh, or else because if you don't have it the yule cat comes along kills you and eats you it's a matter of life and death <laughs> it doesn't just pee on your old clothes on the floor making them no longer available to ever wear again because they will always smell like cat pee no matter what forever no no it's worse than that the cat just kills you which is kind of like a regular cat right yeah. like oh yeah you stop feeding it and you, you pass out on the floor it just starts to eat you exactly uh, if yeah. cats were the size of dogs they would eat us 
Absolutely. No doubt no about question. it. We're talking with Jeff Belanger, who has written a new book, The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters. He's not considered a monster, but he is the big guy. One of the central figures, besides Jesus, in the whole Christmas thing, Santa Claus. Tell us what your book dives into about Santa Claus, where the name comes from, his parallel, Krampus, who we've talked about a little bit as well. Sure, sure. So it's it's important to remember that in most of the world, Santa Claus and St. Nicholas are two different people. Uh, St. Nicholas arrives on December 6th, that's St. Nicholas Day, based on a historical figure from the land of Myra, who was born into a wealthy family, was orphaned, and spent his whole life giving his money away, starting orphanages, doing lots of really great things, and then became the patron saint of sailors, pawnbrokers, uh, and children, to name a few. He's the one that delivers toys on December 6th. Santa Claus would show up later, and it's really the Dutch influence. They called him Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas came over to New Amsterdam, which eventually, of course, became New York, and Sinterklaas was Americanized to Santa Claus. He shows up on December 25th. And so the, these these two figures that we've combined in the United States um, are still very separate in, in Europe. And Santa Claus is really came into his own in like the 1920s, 1930s, when America was in a Great Depression and the Coca-Cola company started using Santa Claus to sell Coke and it worked. People bought Coke. <laughs> and then the following year, other people that sell, I don't know, anything from pizza to donuts to cars to insurance were like, wait a minute, Coca-Cola doesn't own Santa Claus. He could endorse our products or service too. And so pretty soon the holiday became about consumerism. People were spending money. Thanksgiving was moved to the fourth Thursday in November, not the last Thursday. So there was more shopping time for Christmas. Wow. Uh, and really that's when the idea of the holiday becoming about consumerism was born. And all these monsters were pushed far back into the dark recesses of the holiday. But I'm here to say, I, I think they're coming back. And, yes. And, and, uh, they're getting movie deals. They're getting book deals. They're showing <laughs> up on The Office. This dark side has always been there. I just think we're starting to celebrate it again. Although I think that ties into two of the other creatures that are in this book. The ones that come and clean your house in exchange for oh. often nice things. <laughs> I need those people. I know, right? Uh, yeah, the Tomten from Sweden is is like all beard and, and hat and like very little body. It's a helper elf that helps you around the house, but also known to keep you in line. If you're sleeping in too late, getting lazy, he'll sort of poke you around, hit you around. But he asks for a, a stick, a bowl of sticky sweet rice pudding on Christmas Eve called the Riesengrot. And if you leave that out, he will serve you for another year. Worth it. Uh, and the worst thing he can do is leave you. And Boom. then you'll have yes. no help. Agreed. That sounds yeah, like the house so. elves from Harry Potter. I wonder if she stole that idea from this whole ancient tradition. Possibly. I thought it sounded like the elf on the shelf. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Santa's you know, favorite deep state spy. <laughs> this is the opposite of holiday cheer. Yeah. I just want a witch to come to my house and sweep away things looking for Jesus. Yes. <laughs> La Bafana, the Italian Christmas witch. So she comes down your chimney on Epiphany Eve, and uh, she will bring little treats to leave in your kid's shoes. But the best part of all is before she leaves your house, she cleans it. Oh. And then she's off to the next house, which is amazing. I don't know how we sign up for this. I never grew up with this, but I would love to sign up if I could this year. She's the real, the real holiday thing that I want to come by and visit. Thank you. I'm, I'm Italian, so yeah, I'm yeah. waving the flag. Come to our house and do this. <laughs> like, I'm sorry Jesus is not underneath my floorboards, but man, you did a great job. <laughs> if she went to my grandmother's house, Jesus was all over the place. So. <laughs> of course. Jeff Belanger, uh, this book is really, really fun. I love this aspect of the holiday season, these old traditions from all over the place, and the fact that, you know, don't get yourself all bent out of shape because most of the stuff that you're really latching yourself onto is probably pagan. <laughs> so we should all enjoy it together. Let me give you one one final takeaway. On all yeah. This. I, I know we're talking about Khalees is making jokes about holiday cheer. I totally get it. But unless you get into a really dark place, how can you see the light? These monsters, this holiday is designed to do that. Ebenezer Scrooge knew it. When he faced his ghosts, when he faced his monsters, only then could he come out the other side redeemed. And the only way we're going to get redeemed is if we get scared. I know of no other way. So ultimately, these monsters are here to help. <laughs> Jeff Belanger, the author of The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus, and Other Yuletide Monsters. is also a creepy Christmas PBS special that goes along with this. He's the host of the New England Legends Weekly Podcast and is uh, our favorite New England folklorist for all this sort of thing. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Quick reminder that although the monsters' behaviors are fun, we're not endorsing any of them. <laughs> You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Clee Smith. We had been asking 
for your suggestions about best holiday lights in the area. And we are going to get to them a little bit later in the week. But a thank you to Nancy and Dennis and Matt and Ben and more who have submitted where some of the cool Yule lights are. Uh, up and down the four counties of Western Mass. I will make my quick shout out to the house at the end of Maple Street and Hadley who have done a bluey on the side of their house. That is it, delightful. Yeah, I well love done. it when people get really creative like this. So if you know where there are some excellent holiday lights, email us, thefab413 at nepm.org. And we're going to be doing more than just holiday lights as the week progresses and we head close to Christmas. We'll be talking about our favorite holiday music and our favorite holiday movies. And if you have some of those to suggest as well, send us an email. Again, thefab413 at nepm.org. Given what we just heard from Jeff Belanger, Dial Code Santa Claus, if you're not familiar with that one, is one of Khalees and my favorite. You will hear more about this You are absolutely going to hear this. And if you're lucky, we will not play the song from it. No, we definitely will. We should not. (laughs) It's not a good song. Bonnie Bonnie Tyler. Tyler, Tyler, what did they do to you to make you have to do that particular song? (laughs) And what do those lyrics even mean? Where did they come from? I think that it was French translated into English poorly. It feels like the first evidence of Google Translate. Yeah. You're going to hear more about it, but we want to know your favorite (laughs) holiday movies. Favorite holiday songs, The Fab 413 at nepm.org. <laughs> and tomorrow on the show, how many of you really know what Kwanzaa is about? Or how many days it is, or what they're called, or who started this whole thing, and why? Tuesday on The Fabulous 413, we'll get a primer on one of the season's more recent editions with Professor Amalkar Shabazz of UMass Amherst and Ayana Crawford of Take the Mic and More. Plus, a tour of one of the oldest farms in Western Mass, Barstow. I'm Monty Balmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. We'll see you tomorrow on The Fabulous 413.